Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at Long Now. Um, this is the first uh, one of the talks that we've done here at the Interval uh, that's being live streamed. So everyone say hi to the live stream. All right. Yeah, so hopefully we'll do more of these in the future, but we have many members out there uh, listening to the live stream. Um, the next talk in this series is, uh, is actually with the designer of this space, uh, one of the co-designers, Jeffrey McGrew. And he's going to be talking about uh, kind of the future of architecture and the way we build things with machines now. Uh, and he and his wife, Jillian, started because we can after they bought a computer-controlled uh, routing machine, which actually made a lot of the fixtures that are in this space. And they realized that um, fundamentally, you can now do things that only large entities could do before. And so he's been working with Autodesk uh, directly with the CTO at Autodesk and Pier 9 uh, on the kind of all the futures of the way we make things. And so he's going to be giving a talk about that uh, next in this series. And I also want to remind you that uh, we are selling Stuart's book where this uh, image, this Pace Layers diagram first appeared. Uh, it's here and they're all signed, I believe. They're all signed, yes? They all got signed, yes, awesome. Great, okay, so um, that is, uh, that's most of what I have to talk about. The, um, I know that I don't need to give too much of, a, of an introduction to two of our founders, uh, Paul and Stuart, but I'll just do it by telling a little bit of a story, which is that I, I got this job back in 1997. <laughs> it was quite a while ago. Uh, I had hair. Um, and uh, I, had, I had just met several of the board members and was just starting to work on the clock project with Danny Hillis, and, uh, and Stuart Brand called me up, and he said, uh, Brian, you know, and I have been talking about this diagram, and it's about the layers of human time. And so he just started describing it to me, and I started scribbling something out in, in, in Illustrator, and, um, and I kept sending them back and forth to him in email. And, and then you know, the, it was all fine, except for the very top one where I started with a kind of squiggly line. It's like, no more squiggly. And then I sent it back, no more squiggly, no more squiggly. And so finally, I got it crazy squiggly enough. And I thought it was just something that was just going to stay just you know, kind of a, a discussion item. And, uh, and it has now gone forward into the world um, to uh, do all kinds of interesting things. And, and I think back on it now, I would have used much more care. But I think part of it is, uh, is kind of the charm of, of how it was made. And, uh, and now being redrawn with the chalkboard robot technology. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Stuart Brand and Paul Sappho, two of our founders. Thank you very much. So the order of the evening is, is this. Um, Stuart and I see this as a continuation of a conversation he and I have been having. I'm among the many people who have been using Stuart's pace layer model in teaching at Stanford and elsewhere. And it's such a powerful tool. And we started talking about it. And we said, gee, you know, it would be really nice to talk about the origins and, and, and also start a conversation here with how to use the pace layer tool more broadly and the like. So one little detail you have, uh, this is a homework assignment on this sheet. There are a couple of questions. We see this as an opener for the discussion that you can have in the bar afterwards. So we'll end the evening with Stuart answering the questions on this sheet just to get everybody going. What we're going to do, Stuart's going to talk first and talk about the origins of the idea and how he developed it. So it's a, a wonderful case study in how very powerful ideas come to pass. And I'm going to offer a couple of remarks about how I, I, I'm sort of a parasite living off of his big ideas. Uh, a happy parasite um, corrupting youth and a couple of the surprises I've found in the process of using it. And then we're going to go into a group discussion here. So you're teaching this at Stanford, is that right? Is I use it in my class at Stanford. What kind of class is that? Uh, I teach uh, forecasting. So uh, my course this quarter is uh, for Foresight for Innovators, ME 297. And we also use it at Singularity University. So and we have some folks in the room who will come to later who are actually are using it in their work and teaching. Amazing. Uh, how's sound? Can you hear me okay? Really, really? 
A little louder. Is there a louder? Is there gain control somewhere other than me? It's you. It's me. <laughs> I was afraid of that. All right. Um, like all good things, this was stolen. <laughs> And it came out of a book I was working on in the late 80s, early 90s, called How Buildings Learn. And the problem, the problem that the book was trying to address is why do architects keep making at vast expense buildings that people absolutely detest? <laughs> and I had some various angles on that, but I needed something to stitch the whole book together. And then when I was in London in uh, 1990, I met uh, Frank Duffy and his partner, John Worthington, who back in 1972 had done the analysis of how money actually gets spent in buildings. And typically over a 50 year time frame, most of the money spent in the building will not be the original construction. That's only one third. Two thirds is spent on all of the remodeling, reconstruction, adding stuff to the skin, all these kinds of things go on later. And they figured out that's where the money is. So they started a company called DEGW. Duffy was D, Worthington was W. And they made a mint for years doing basically remodeling. And Duffy was one of the founders of what's called uh, uh, facilitation management. And back in 72, they came up with the fundamental problem of buildings, which is that they're always trying to tear themselves apart. In the sense that what they called the shell, which is the outer structure, is there, that's the building. But then the, the services get swapped out every 15, 20 years or so. And, uh, and uh, what they call the scenery, the space plan, especially in commercial buildings, is changing every five years or so. And then what they call the, uh, the sets, which is the furniture, is moving on a monthly basis. All of that movement tends to tear a building apart. And Architects want to design the perfect building that will stay the way they designed it forever and nobody can fuck with it. So they will put the services deep inside the walls of the structure. So the only way you can change the services when you have to do that in 12 or 15 years time is tear down the building. And the architects are fine with that, but the users are not. So anyway, I took this scheme which gave me what I needed, which was a sense of pace layering in buildings. And I added a couple layers to kind of general purpose. This stuff is, uh, you know, the stuff. And the furniture and space plan, indeed, it changes like they said it did. Um, I added skin. The outside of buildings tends to change quite a lot. Sometimes for technical reasons, often for aesthetic reasons. The structure is the building, 60 or 70 years. After I finished the book in this diagram, and I started spending more time with uh, all of this material because I was out talking about it, I realized that I missed a couple of things, which is that windows are not part of skin. Windows are changing much more frequently, kind of at the, about the rate of services. And I completely left out landscape architecture, which I'm describing here as scenery, which changes at about the same rate as skin. So the way the building looks and the way the area around the building looks changes uh, pretty rapidly. In case you think that the slowest part of this site is not really eternal, take a look at what happened in Boston between 1860 and uh, 1981. There's just one building, the old South Meeting House, because there are a bunch of fires in Boston. Uh, there's only one building that was there over that whole period of time. But if you look at the streets, which is the site, the legal site, the political site, the way the streets go and the way the property lines go, the lots go, don't change. And they're not going to change. Boston is going to look like that forever. And these huge skyscrapers have to dance to that choreography. So that's the kind of thing you see with pace layering in buildings. And it's interesting, if you look through the uh, many Amazon reviews of the book, quite a lot of people uh, decided that it was actually about software. <laughs> <laughs> and systems, and systems design. And I'm pretty sure that they you know, he ends up with saying, uh, oh, the book might have something to say about buildings too. About a third of the reviews are of this sort. What they're responding to is the pace layering, obviously. 
And so as I got a sense of that and was then moving into this book, The Clock for the Long Now in the 1989, uh, I got to thinking this is going to be about what we do here, trying to encourage long-term thinking and responsibility. And is there a pace layering of civilization that could be imagined? Probably not a shearing layers, because civilization and society is not trying to tear itself apart. But I'd already learned from the buildings that how buildings learn over time is that these fast parts gradually suggest things to the building which gets integrated into the slow parts, and that's how buildings become wise over time and eventually become loved, despite the architect's best efforts. So, how was I going to do that? And I was in the studio of Brian Eno in London in uh, 1996 in December, and uh, we got chatting about this and kind of going through the layers, and he persuaded me that art was not a layer, uh, because art was both operating at sort of fashion scale, but also something that kind of at cultural scale. Uh, but fashion, which Brian is extremely interested in, uh, very much has that quality. Fashion is about fashion. That's why the curly line. It's always referring to itself and going back on itself and repeating itself and going deeper into itself and trying all sorts of changes on itself. Um, government, we realized, was not the right word. Laws, really, economics and then wound up with governance as, uh, as the word that probably would work. So that became the diagram. And uh, that's pretty much the way it was drawn by Alexander. A Couple of things to, to say about it is there has to be slippage. There has to even be a kind of a negative feedback edginess between the layers. So if commerce persuades governance to operate at its pace, you will have Maxam cutting down all of the redwood trees in Northern California because uh, they get more money from that than they would from bank interest. Uh, if you have a religious group who thinks that governance should not change from medieval Sharia law, <laughs> you're probably going to have some serious, serious disjunctions. If you have governance changing quickly, when the U.S. went into Iraq and threw out the entire Ba'athist government and then had no government as a result, that was like stupidity on the level of understanding how these cases work. The same thing happened in Russia with the nature of their revolution. The same thing happened in France with the nature of their revolution. Sudden changes in slow-moving layers is probably a mistake. Now, if you're young or you live in cities, the world looks more like this. Everything's moving. You're focusing on the quick stuff. Young people are obsessed with fashion. I can tell you as a 76-year-old that old people are insanely bored with fashion. <laughs> We've seen it all come by so many times, we don't even want to keep track anymore. But on the other hand, half of the world now lives in cities. In, in a couple decades' time, 80% of the world will live in cities. So more and more of the world will be looking at, thinking about the pace layering of their civilization in these kind of terms. Now, if you're an older person, or you live out in the countryside, or you work it long now, <laughs> it looks more like culture is the big event, and fashion is just something happening off in uh, the kind of trivial distance. It is the case, is this century moves on, that people are lasting longer. There's going to be more old people. Jesse Ausubel was saying last week, we are now at peak children. We will not have a greater proportion of children, probably for the rest of humanity. And so more and more old people, I mean, when you get the, together for holidays, there's going to be four generations, soon five generations, not as many cousins. How are those generations going to talk to each other? And about what? One of the things we'll be learning, I think. So, to sum up, the fast layers learn and innovate and try things. Uh, slow parts remember, posing, disposing. Shocks happen to systems, and it's one of the things you want fast layers in a really resilient system to be able to 
absorb it, run with it. Okay, a whole new technology, fine, we'll make money out of it, and then the commerce figures out what to do with it, and then that trickles down to government, which integrates the shocks. Discontinuity is the big event in the fast parts. Continuity is the main event in the slow parts. Innovation, sometimes revolution, comes from the fast part. Not only constancy, but constraint. If the slow parts aren't occasionally frustrating you, they're not doing their job. But if you don't respect them for doing that, you don't understand how the world works. And, by the way, uh, you know, the fast stuff, we read the newspapers, the magazines, things online, uh, fast stuff gets all the attention. But guess what? With all the constraints and so on, all the power is in the slow parts. Now these, this diagram is having a life of its own. Is Jeff Fien here tonight? Who's going to come? Um, I didn't even know what a full stack is, but full stack engineers apparently work with the whole array of front end, back end, data store, and so on. I didn't know that. So this diagram is having a life of its own out there. There's, there's other versions of it. Uh, they're getting more and more gaudy. I kind of like that the bottom one is sort of the earth. And uh, here we are doing yet another version. Here. Cool. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> so um, the notion of standing in front of the Pope discoursing on the finer points of theology comes to mind. <laughs> um, and and I, I second Stuart's notion, by all means, steal. But if you do steal, the way you pay back is you do your best to try and extend it a little bit. And so I'm not sure I can extend it much, but I can share some thoughts that have come up in the course of conversations uh, with my students. And uh, you know, there's an old saying, the difference between a consultant and a professor. Consultant takes a year's worth of work and compresses it into an hour. And a professor does the opposite. Uh, I'm going to try to be more like a consultant, and I'm going to really come down to two ideas and, and a question. And um, the, um, let's move up one slide here. So my... Oh, that's a dark that's, slide. That's a dark slide, yes. That's a real slide. That's a real slide. Um, two points. First one is the question of speed. And when are, where does speed interact with nonlinearity? And then the second point I'll come to in a few minutes is the notion of productive turbulence. So in the pace layer, Stewart said, you know, shallow is, is fast, uh, discontinuous, discontinuous, slow is more continuous, and the like. Well, and, and a good example of something slow would be this, the San Andreas Fault, uh, which, by the way, is, is, is relevant to us here. A marvelous example of a slow process. So on average, it moves about two and a half inches a year, about as fast as your fingernails grow. It's what determined it and the processes as part of determine the shape of the Bay Area. Without the fault, we would not have the Bay Area, and it probably you can pull a thread, thread straight through to the fastest thing in the Bay Area, and that's change in Silicon Valley. If the fault wasn't here, we wouldn't have Silicon Valley. Um, and that's all good news. I mean, the only downside is that two and a half inches a year, of course, that means in 10 million years, you know, recall we're on the east side of the fault, Los Angeles is on the west side. That means in about 10 million years, we'll be a suburb of LA, which is not a pretty prospect. Um, so slow, stately, magisterial, building the mountains, except uh, there are times when you have nonlinear processes like the Napa quake this is a picture of. So sometimes deep layers can be also very fast in discontinuous ways. And so I think of the, the difference is it's, it's almost um, the difference between the standard and the inverted order with the pace layer. Standard order is con continuity is at the bottom, discontinuity is at the top, slows at the bottom, fast is at the top, except there are times when lower layers move faster than upper layers. And when that suddenly happens, um, that's when you have revolutions and dramatic changes. The 1906 quake was a moment when the fault moved very quickly, had a big impact of an infrastructure, and then you start seeing effects ripple out through the other layers. 
A year later, it led to the panic of 1907 because all those insurers who were way long on insurance in San Francisco had to pay out, and it caused a financial crisis in London, and we had the panic. Uh, and there are lots of other examples of low and slow causing high and fast. The explosion of Krakatoa in 1886 was the final straw that led to the Bantan Revolt in Indonesia, which is the birth of Muslim fundamentalism. So if you want to understand ISIS today, you go back to the Krakatoa explosion. And then the Lisbon earthquake, uh, 1755, changed the course of the Enlightenment, launched Immanuel Kant's career, and gave us Pangloss and Candide, the best of all possible worlds. So you see it hitting culture and just zigzagging all through once you get one of these big, uh, big changes. Um, but what's really interesting is it also affects a local revolution. So this is, of course, an S-curve standing in place for your preferred exponential change, Moore's Law and the like. And what's interesting about it is it shows the ordinary or order. You know, in Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs like to draw uh, hockey stick curves, but we all know they're S-curves for a reason. And the reason why they're S-curves is eventually a slower layer catches up with the fast layer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the web revolution is leveling off because now Congress is catching up and trying to, to fix things. So, uh, it, you know, the lower layers can sometimes drag down things. And the only reason Moore's Law, in my opinion, has installed is it because members of Congress are so technologically illiterate they don't understand it well enough to, to mess with it. But also think about Tahrir Square in the Arab Spring. Tahrir Square, in a way, happened because a lower layer culture went ramming up into governance. And we had the Arab Spring, but then governance figured out how to squeeze the life of the child in its crib, and we went back to the, the pharaohs and the like. So that's the first idea that low is slow, but it also can be nonlinear, and very often it tends to be exponential. Um, uh, keep in mind the Richter scale itself is an exponential scale. Earthquakes fo um, follow a power law, and that's why big earthquakes are rather rare. And just an aside, by the way, you know, remember you are in a 70-year-old building that was built by the low-cost bidder for the U.S. government when it was in a rush. The San Andreas Fault is approximately seven and a half miles to the west. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. If it starts to shake, follow me out that door. I'll run screaming with my hands in the air. So the second point is turbulence, what Stuart was calling slippage. Uh, hidden in this nonlinearity, I think, is an even more important phenomena, that the, ba the boundaries between the la pace layers don't always just have slippage. They also have turbulence. And, and I've come to the conclusion that the boundaries of the pace layers are actually more interesting in terms of, of innovation and change than the pace layers are themselves. It's the constructive turbulence between pace layers that leads to uncertainty and surprise and innovation. You can think of those boundaries as the most productive zones of the, space layer, the pace layer. In effect, they are the intertidal zones. You know, that's where all the action is in the oceans, right where it touches the shoreline. And, um, and a good analogy. So this is Jupiter. Um, and right up there, right in the southern equatorial belt, is, is a zone of uh, what's called velocity shear. This is, um, the, uh, uh, well, I'll spare the physics for everyone, but trust me, the, the two zones are moving at different speeds, and you get these little whips and whirls. And that turbulent interaction is the most interesting part of Jupiter. But the turbulent interaction between pace layers here in the valley is, is also the same thing. Think about how the internet came about, this combination of interaction between culture, the counterculture of the 60s, plus technology. There's a reason why the internet, and Stuart wrote, was one of the first people to write about it, why the internet was architected the way it was. It wasn't an accident. It was the intersection of technology and, and culture. I also have a hypothesis that the layers don't just differ, differ in speed, they differ in viscosity. That the lower layers are viscous. San Andreas Fault moves in, in nonlinear ways because it's, it's very viscous and, and, and can't move, move smoothly. Also, turbulent boundaries are really productive zones for Silicon Valley specifically. 
Um, you are here. This is the great spot on Jupiter. And it's a very particular kind. It's basically a standing vortex. Mm -hmm. It's been there for a long time. Well, think about Silicon Valley mm -hmm. as a standing vortex of different pace layers coming together and mixing. And you know, the big blob up there, well, that was HP. And there's Apple and little blobs. There's Facebook all coming out. And it's uh, mathematically described. Uh, it's uh, the von Karman vortex street. So we all live on von Karman street. Um, so I think that thinking about the fact that turbulence is a really powerful thing in the pace layers. It's not always bad. It's what creates the intersections of different technologies. It throws people together and the like. And it adds lots of, lots of surprise. So I'll close with a question. Um, thinking about just how much can you, you think about with the pace layer. And it's nice to think about the pace layer that you know, it's really non-controversial. It's really clear, clean architectural. Well, ask yourself. Where does God hang out? <laughs> and of course, this group, I suspect, we would all put God right up here in culture. Yeah, it's like, you know, yeah, you know, it's that thing people do on Sundays and, you know, some kind of casual Buddhist and the like. But there are people who might disagree. In fact, they might disagree so firmly that I have to redraw the pace layer diagram to fit them in. So here's my abstracted out larger pace layer that they're that take all of human activity, that's anthros, below it is bios, below that is lithos, the domain of the San Andreas Fault. So you think of bios, that thin little uh, you know, surface of atmosphere and stuff at the top that we, we now know it goes into lithos. And then beneath that, of course, is cosmos. And a very devout religious person would probably say, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not, God's not in culture, he's not even in cosmos, he's like behind the whole ball of wax. So as you play with this, think about you know, the kinds of where do things fit, what are the sublayers within the pace layer, and you know, is, is there space for everyone, including God? And I'll stop. Great. So, okay, we have your class here. What are you going to do with them? Yes. Well, the first thing is um, that uh, there's no homework. Well, the homework assignment is over alcohol at the end. Um, uh, but just as a conversation starter, there are a couple of people in this room. There, there are more than a couple of people in this room who've been using the pace layer stuff professionally. And, and I picked on two of them in advance. And I asked if they would just briefly make a comment. So do we have the hand? Oh, we have the handheld. Is it on? Oh, you got it. If you can go to Andrea Saveri first. So, uh, Andrea, just briefly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Andrea is <laughs> over. Yes. She's been doing a lot of work in forecasting uh, over at, at Hayward, Cal State Hayward, and also um, teaching futures methods to high school students. And so, just say a word about how you use pace layers. Yeah, I mean, basically, I've been using the pace layers with students who are uh, between like 14 and 15 and maybe early 20s, 2021. And I mean, basically, what it does is make something that's very abstract. Um, it gives it a framework. They have related to all of those layers in some way. And so it's a concrete, a concretization of the future. I mean, they can understand time horizon at, you know, a hundred year time horizon, 500, a thousand in a way that's concrete that they couldn't have without it. And also I think what, what the, you know, it's pace layer. So the sense of that dynamic at each layer, all of a sudden the future becomes something that they're connected to. And um, mm. it's just a very useful way for them as they're really learning how to deal with abstract thinking to, to kind of have a framework and to connect themselves really to the long-term future. So we have a lot of fun with it. Good. Thanks, Andrea. And if we can run the mic over to Pete Leiden from Reinventors, XGBNer. Well, like a lot of good ideas, um, it's not just that you apply it literally, it's how did it really affect my thinking. And I, I was actually around GBN around the time this came out, and it's really th influenced my thinking a lot. And one of the things, I, including 
the creation of a company at my last com a company that I'm in right now for the last three years. Now, one of the reasons I've thought about this a lot is, to me, I think this was always kind of a ideal, or it was kind of like a, a way to think about normalcy. And I keep thinking about the early 21st century, to what extent infrastructure is changing in a kind of a, an accelerated rate, particularly around the digitization of everything, how culture, where we're kind of globalizing everything, is like accelerating kind of cultural change at some level, and with climate change, how nature is in fact going through some big changes that is for forcing change. Now, to me, what's interesting is the governance piece right now is the most static and in most stasis. And most people would actually, in the West, and I think actually around the world, would see there's very little innovation in governance to respond to those big changes happening in the digitization of everything, the globalization of everything, and ultimately, you know, everything going sustainable ultimately over time. And so to me, it's influenced my own kind of thinking in my company is to focus on driving more innovation into governance. Because to me, that's the lag, that's the pace right now or the layer that is most essentially entrophied or, or, or in basically uh, in need of some fundamental reinvention. And so my company, Reinventors, essentially is helping drive a lot more innovation into governance and governance systems. And it's been inspired a lot by thinking about where is most needed, where is the change most needed today? And to my mind, it's in that layer, because if we can flip some real fundamental innovation in that space, the rest of these kind of transitions could take off uh, much more fluidly. Anyhow, thank you. So it's concrete and practical, the kind of influence it's had on me. Yeah, Pete, I would say that the thing to look for is where is governance actually being responsive, and it's in cities, uh, which tend to go faster anyway. And, and city governments, governance is you know, kind of at the level of potholes. There's not as much ideology involved and kind of solving the problems as they emerge. A lot of them are economic and so on. And, but national governance, I think, has some of the issues you talk about, and it's much more at the kind of ideological, cultural level. And wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised that city governance is more fast-moving and responsive than national governance. And we may well see, and are already seeing economically, that, that cities are economically much more powerful than whole nations in many cases. And we may see a period in which city-states, uh, you know, the Singapores of the world, uh, like Venice back when, are the really operative governance elements, uh, which might not be a bad thing. So let's stick on governance. Um, we had a, a question, um, and I will go to the audience in a, a moment here, a question from Nisarg in the um, live stream. Uh, how will you show ex space exploration in the next 50 years in pace layers? And I think about that in terms of governance, that um, you know, this is a time, arguably, where there's waning national power. Can city-states go into space? Is it up to commercial? Which pace layers come together to get us into space in 50 years? Well, you've seen a migration from it was something that only governments could do, and some governments are still doing it, China and India and Japan, and became sort of infrastructural with the satellites, the communication satellites. But increasingly, it's commercial money that's SpaceX and so on that's, that's pushing. Yeah. And so in a sense, space is, is moving into the, the more rapid area. At least a close space. The farther out space. Further out space, I, well, I mean, Elon Musk really wants to go to Mars. He's not kidding. And I'm really loving the idea. <laughs> I mean, I could nominate all sorts of people for a one-way trip to Mars. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's also interesting thinking about governance and the origins of Silicon Valley, that it was intersection of technology and governance that launched the valley because of the geopolitics of the space race, mm. you know, an early adopter is someone who pays too much for something that doesn't quite work. And um, thanks to the space race, the federal government were the dream early adopters for the Intels. Mm -hmm. And I think if we hadn't had the space race, you know, we might still have analog computers. Well, you know, we had the great salt talk from Mariana Mazzucato basically saying that the most radical innovation is, comes from good governance, uh, taking chances that commerce would never take, uh, that aren't in infrastructure yet, you're trying them out. And uh, I think that's one of the things that 
a really solid institution can be way more radical, and universities at their best have this quality, and uh, government R&D at its best has this quality. They don't have to prove stuff at a commercial pace, which is, you know, just a couple of years' time, and, and uh, then you're out of the game. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It just reminded me, um, a recommendation of a book you all should look up. Uh, have you ever run across Elliot Jakes? By name only. By name only. He wrote a book, and I, I know this is a, this is a deal killer, uh, with this scintillating title, A General Theory of Bureaucracy. Uh, <laughs> but it's a page turner, uh, and he... <laughs> It really is. Um, and he has a model of what he calls um, time span of discretion, that a manager can be ranked on a one to seven scale on their time span of discretion. That amount of time from which they can formulate a goal and the goal can be achieved. So a level one is someone who thinks 20 minutes in the future, that'd be your average member of Congress, to a level six or seven, a Gandhi or Matsushita or a Christ who could set into motion a goal that would be successfully completed centuries after they passed away. Wow. And I always thought of that is, you know, is, is the problem with democracy is it forces mm -hmm. the short, to, rewards the short and punishes the long. Famous problem. And where you see that in city governments is cities that go from being crap to being wonderful typically have mayors that are uh, not termed out, that are in place for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, when you get, one would love to have term limits be sort of optional, we, Mike Bloomberg made that happen, uh, to where when you've got somebody you actually, you like and they have these long-term goals and they're good at it and they're building a team that can actually make it happen, uh, you should be able to, I think, to say, actually, we're going to keep this one for a while and we'll revisit it each election period, but let them stay in for now. That's a good idea. Um, questions from the audience. So who has a really great question? Ooh. <laughs> or, no you know, pressure. A really shitty one will do. <laughs> okay, let's go to the gentleman, uh, dark hair, beard, right? And our goal is to make Xander move as much as possible. And stand up when you yeah, speak so we can see up. you. Say who you are. Ah, thank you. Hello. Uh, who, who are you? Peter Marquitos. Hi. Um, I keep thinking about where technology falls into this, and it seems to hop around in, in my mind, but it's just wondering... It's not in a layer. It's all yeah. over the place, like gravity. Okay. Well, I don't know if that's a really great question, but I wanted to ask. Good. Well, I also, that, that opens up... I, you know, I, I looked hard at that when we were doing this, because I thought, well, you know, technology, acceleration, Moore's Law, that's kind of stuff has got to be in here somewhere. It turned out taking it out actually helped think about technology, is how it plays in these various levels. And also thinking about institutions as, you know, you can draw kind of a circle about where an institution lives and how does it cross cut across the layers? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and is there a public side to the institution that is, you know, very deep or a private side that's very deep and a public side that's fast moving? Speaking of which, if you had to pick an institution that sort of grocks pace layer thinking the best, what's your favorite institution? Let's get some more questions okay. from the audience while I think about that. <laughs> Xander has a question. Um, so I'm holding the mic hostage. Uh, the, um, I, I've often wondered where kind of, you mentioned it a little bit with um, Congress only having a 20 minute horizon. And I find what's interesting in, in your example of long term mayors, the, my favorite one is one of the longest term mayors in modern history was in Japan. And he had been in office for like 40 years, and he went against everybody in all of the local governments and his own town to build a 70-foot tsunami barrier in the valley in front of their, their town because he remembered the previous one. And it had never been in use. He died in office. And then a few years later came the big Japanese tsunami. They closed the thing. It saved the entire town. And, and there's no other mayor that could ever have done that without that long-term, you know, power that he had gained. And, you know, monarchies also have this kind of ability to think very long term. Democracies, we're finding, are more and more and more short term. Where does, where do we get our long termness uh, in democracies? Does it have a place? Um, do we have to fix it in another way? I keep, I keep coming back to Venice, which danced on the razor's edge for a thousand years. 
as a mercantile empire. And um, they didn't have a democracy, they had the world's strangest republic, where there were so many layers of weird voting that went on before the people in charge, and they really did turn people out. And the Doge uh, was a total figurehead that was not in charge of much of anything, um, unless he inspired people to do stuff, like attack Constantinople. Um, or a lie with the, the Moors in Egypt to knock the Portuguese out of the Indian Ocean, which went over really big with the Pope. Well, that's why your Prince Henry the Navigator went around sure. Africa. So it was the right thing to do. Uh, <laughs> like we said, it's been a long conversation. You're just kidding. You know, by the way, when, think about when Venice went off the rails. And C.P. Snow in... It two. was knocked off the rails by Napoleon Bonaparte, who could not stand another republic beside his own. Yeah, but there was some other stuff around there involving the, the Khan and snipping off the trade routes and the competition with Genoa. But C.P. Snow has a wonderful passage in the two cultures that, that, that I like to refer to as the case of the blind Venetians. Um, and, and I won't do it justice, but he said... He was talking about England in mid-century. He said, I am reminded of the Venetian Republic in their final years. It was about 15, 15, uh, 20, 15, 30. He said, they were very successful, practical men. Uh, they business were, men. That was a yeah, commerce they were operation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, and they, they, they knew that events had begun to turn against them. And they knew exactly what they needed to do in order to stay on top of the trade and power. The problem was they had become accustomed to the old order. They never found the will to break it. And that was how Venice ended up becoming sinking into the swamp that once sustained it with its, its ocean. And he admits it's a, you know, a bit of a, a, a myth, but I think it's a very compelling myth. By the way, Venice is doing fine just now, and it's in business of oh, yeah. attracting you and your money. To, yeah, uh, it's, don't there. go there. It's too crowded. <laughs> Other questions? Um, how, how, uh, let's get some gender balance here. Is awesome. Uh, Xander, it's all the way in the back. No, 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 no we got to... Bear in mind there are people live streaming who are God knows where they are. Given the pace of global warming and change, would you change the arrow for nature on your diagram? I think I'll say, I'll say something about that at the end because I want to answer Paul's written question. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, no, I don't. I'll let you okay. duck it if you wish. When we get to that. <laughs> so, By the way, the institution that thinks uh, completely in layered terms is the Long Now Foundation. And in about 200 years' time, it should you know, have it pretty well in hand. Boy, and wait till you try our Keep two those member dollars coming. <laughs> so, that, that by then, the 200-year-old gin... Um, that's what that curly Q line is in fashion after you leave the interval bar. Um, so Xander, I hate to do it to you. Where are you? Over here, there's a young lady at the bar speaking ah, about yes. Jen. So my question is about wealth as one mm. of the catalysts maybe for this acceleration of change. And I wonder what thoughts you have about the role that in uh, you know, capitalistic society and sort of, you talk about democracy, but there's another layer on top of that, which is capitalism. Mm -hmm. How does that accelerate the change that we're talking about and reduce the long-term vision? It's a wonderful question. Growing prosperity worldwide is a huge event. It's going on absolutely everywhere. And we think of Africa as a basket case that they have a much greater growth rate than we do or anybody in Europe, the GDP and all the rest of it. Likewise in Asia and uh, South Asia and so on. Maybe one way to think about it is, is uh, prosperity is an urban phenomenon to a large extent. It's where the, a lot of the economic sort of value added and all that stuff goes on. As people are moving out of 
the poverty of subsistence farms. They've got a cousin in town. They go to hang out with a cousin. The cousin gets them a job in the squatter city. They start to have a regular income, which they never had before. Pretty soon, the rest of their family comes to town. They leave the subsistence farm behind, which turns back into forest. Um, it's speeding things up in kind of the urban way that I, I was showing that, you know, the, the, the urban look of this makes fashion and commerce and, and infrastructure huge. And the developing economies really are developing. That used to be a euphemism, but in the last 30, 40 years, it's become the truth. So they are becoming developed economies. And the way we think about the way things have happened in Europe or in North America is increasingly the way things happen all over the world. And that's why we're becoming a city planet. And how the layers play out in a city planet versus what was previously a rural planet is what we'll be figuring out and dealing with and getting comfortable with in this century. So China. China? China. I was having a conversation with someone recently who, I, whose name I can't mention, but he said, you know, the problem in my country is Chinese is we have a values crisis. He said, people are still members of the Communist Party, but mm -hmm. it has no meaning to them. It's just a rotting institution, and they don't have anything else to turn to. And he said, we're all pursuing wealth, but we have a values crisis. So is, how does one, when you have rapidly rising wealth, how do the other pace layers interact? And does China need a new religion? That's a great question. And that, that's a nice bounce on your question, is China is a classic case. This is why I think the wild card in China is that the Dalai Lama will save China. <laughs> that the Chinese are all going to become Buddhists again. Kevin Kelly is persuaded, and he's very persuasive, that they're all going to become Christians, and they'll get their morality that way, which <laughs> um, <laughs> fine with me. Yeah. Um, here's a question from the... Um, yeah, that's an open question, so I sure don't have an answer. And Orville yeah. Shell isn't here, so... Yeah. Um, question from Ron online. Do pace layer changes relate logarithmically in terms of speed? Um, bear in mind, this is a data-free diagram. <laughs> 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 the buildings diagram, there's real numbers. This diagram is just total hand wave. And uh, so, you know, between linear and logarithmic, sure. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is it is amazing. I continue to be shocked by, as, as a species, we are just not wired to understand exponentials. I mean, I know people who can do the equations, but they cannot grok exponentials. It, to me, if there was one crucial piece of literacy that everybody needed to learn, is to thoroughly un understand exponentials. And you and don't have you, to get a slide rule, but... When you teach it, how do you teach it? How do you get people to believe it? Uh, well, there are all the classic, classic examples. There's King Kareem's chessboard, the servant who invents chess, and the grateful teen says, you know, put, what would you like? He says, I would just like you to put one grain of rice on the first square, and two grains of rice on the second square. That one works pretty well, mm -hmm. you know, because halfway through the chessboard you have more rice than you know, is occupied by the volume of the Himalayas. The other one I, I tend to use with parents of young children, uh, and it's best told to the kids. You mm -hmm. say, look, okay, when you get that conversation with your parents about your allowance, don't negotiate for 20 or 50 bucks a week or whatever it goes for. I say, look, I'm you know, a very modest child. Just give me one penny in the first week and then double it every week and let's see so February uh, what is it January 26th that somewhere around August 1st they will be wealthier than Bill Gates <laughs> don't fall for it if your kids do it so I think we have about five minutes left I would say that there's great folly and error that can come from over attention to exponentials and I had this uh, as a believer in the population bomb. Thomas Malthus was right, that my old teacher Paul Ehrlich was right, that human population was on a total uh, asymptotic curve and uh, we were gonna outweigh the Earth pretty darn soon. And all you're saying, oh, that's your S curve. 
No, but this is exactly why we need pace layers. Uh -huh. If Paul Ehrlich had had the pace layer diagram, the population bomb wouldn't have been a bestseller because it would have been right. Mm -hmm. You would have gotten the facts right. That it's that cross impact of multiple layers operating together that blunts exponentials in the same way it turns hockey sticks into S curves. Okay. Anyway, watch out for exponentials. It's, uh, it's a way that people make people afraid of uh, super intelligence, artificial AIs that are going to become uh, singular, singularitarianly smart and eliminate us just because they can. That's exponential horseshit. <laughs> Amen. And besides, when we finally have machines that pass the Turing test, what we're going to really discover is how many of our friends don't. What? Well, <laughs> So we have, I think we should, we are right at the end of time. We have less than five minutes, right? No, should ten. We? Well, what the, who knows? Five. Okay. Um, do I, I do one question and then go to Stuart? Okay. Um, you have been so patient, and I don't want Xander to have to run anymore. Um, so in... So you, who are you? you? Oh, sorry. I'm Noah. Uh, Noah Ty. I, I'm just a guy. Um, <laughs> So in your original diagram then from that piece of uh, notebook paper, you had like written art and then crossed it out. And so I was thinking about that, and I noticed that um, art often operates on the layer of fashion, but always strives to sort of hop over all the other layers and, and hop straight to culture. Um, and, and it seems like other, other fields try to do this as well. So for instance, consumer technology often operates at fashion and maybe commerce, but strives to be infrastructure and sometimes even culture. Um, does that seem like cheating to you? <laughs> and uh, like, wh why? How do, how do we differentiate when we see art? Um, how? Why is some of it? Why does some of it end up in culture rather than fashion, or vice versa? I think um, w one of the things that Brian Eno was very interested in this, and, he, and, and he's persuaded that uh, art is. Um, doggedly non-functional uh, and fashion is doggedly non-functional so we wear these colors but you know, there's, there's not actually any reason to do it other than it's the color we like or it's different than the color that we don't like anymore because blah 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 and his view is that surprise and innovation are things that we need to be braced for because some of them are quite serious, like the earthquakes. And the way we get practice in dealing with surprises is by these irrelevant artistic things that occur. What's that? My kid could draw that. Why are you people all taking it so seriously and paying so much money for it? Now I have to think about it. Uh, weird stuff is supposed to come from art. Uh, you go to Burning Man, and your mind is supposed to get blown several times a day, and on a good year, you do. And you come back cheered up, uh, refreshed, and exercised, I think is, is, is Brian's view, that art keeps us exercised with radical originality in a way that doesn't actually hurt anybody, but nevertheless goes deep. Good art does that. So bring it on, and indeed, you're right, it does strive to become deep and permanent and profound, and some does, and that's part of the function of the layers is that it's a sifting device to sift the stuff that keeps on mattering to people. It was, I mean, I remember when hula hoops and jogging came along in the same summer, and the hula hoops, they knew it was not going to last past that summer. They only made so many hula hoops. And jogging, who knows? But jogging you know, moved on to become this whole... I go to CrossFit because jogging started in that summer. Exercise became a thing that civilized people do. And it went deep, and it's, it's in there now. So you keep on trying lots and lots and lots of stuff is what the fast layers are about. That would be a perfect place to stop, except I'm dying to hear your answer to this question. Uh, uh, the global issue, challenge foremost in your mind, of which pace layer did emerge, which pace layer's impacts most felt, pace layer's solution likely to emerge. 
Um, I'll pick climate change, which came out of a funny uh, intersection of <laughs> commerce and nature. Uh, commerce over a long time put up lots of um, greenhouse gases. Nature is saying, oh, I know how to do that. Greenhouse gases, I've had those before. I'll just start warming and doing all these things. Pace layers, the, where it's being most felt, government is interestingly confused about climate change because um, we do not have global governance, but we do have a global problem in climate change. And one of the byproducts of climate change may well be some of the beginnings, or not, there's already beginnings, there's various economic global bodies and so on. Um, there's lots of scientific global bodies, but I think there will start to be global bodies because of climate change with a little more uh, level of agreement in teeth and so on. And where the solution is likely to emerge, I think the straightforward infrastructure, the next SALT talk I will now promote, is David Keith. Uh, the, he's a climate scientist, and his, uh, the talk is titled Patient Geoengineering. Uh, you ask him here, how long will it take to resolve? He says, um, we can do climate geoengineering direct intervention in climate, probably using uh, aerosols in the stratosphere. We can do it gradually, we can do it carefully, we can do it in ways that are easy to reverse, and we can do it patiently, which means it'll take 200 years. But the idea is that that gives us enough time to get over putting out too many uh, greenhouse gases, and you can basically phase the system in with the idea that you're gonna phase the system out so we do not have to be in charge of the climate for more than 200 years. That's mine. Perfect, thank you. So, I wanna thank you, Stuart, for this conversation and for coming up with the pace layer model, which has given us so much thought. And uh, let's give Stuart a hand.